people glorious and arrogant, valiant and headstrong. These were the men and women who laid the very foundations of Western civilization. Their monuments still recall perhaps the most extraordinary two centuries in history. A time which saw the birth of science and politics, philosophy, literature and drama. Which saw the creation of art and architecture. We still strive to equal. The Greeks achieved all this against a backdrop of war and conflict. For they would vanquish armies, navies, empires many times their size, and build an empire of their own which stretched across the Mediterranean. For one brief moment, the mighty warships of the Greeks ruled the seas, their prosperity unequal. These achievements, achievements which still shape our world, were made not by figures lost to time, but by men and women whose voices we can still hear, whose lives we can still follow. Men such as Themistocles, one of the world's greatest military generals. Pericles, a politician of vision and genius and Socrates, the most famous philosopher in history. This is the story of these astonishing individuals, of the rise and fall of a civilization that changed the world. The great Persian king Darius died in 486 BC, and his son Xerxes assumed his father's throne. Xerxes' first action was to vow vengeance for his father's defeat at the hands of the Athenians. On my father's behalf, and on behalf of all my subjects, I will not rest until I have taken Athens and burnt it to the ground. As an imperial power, the Persians cannot allow small regional states like this to uh, beat them with impunity. Xerxes began to gather his forces. He conscripted troops from every corner of his empire. Arabians, Egyptians, Phoenicians, as well as Persians. Rumors began to leak back to Athens that Xerxes' army numbered nearly two million men, that it was the greatest force the world had ever seen, that soon it would be ready to march. And then finally, in the spring of 480 BC, news reached Athens. The Persian army had set out for Greece. History records that Xerxes' troops drank rivers dry. Trampled fields to the raw earth. Ravaging the land as they marched on towards Greece. Xerxes was confident of victory. We shall so extend the empire of Persia that its boundaries will be God's own sky so that the sun will not look on any land that is not ours. When the Greeks realized that the Persians were invading again, terror gripped the whole country. For the Athenians, who knew that they would be Xerxes' first target, it seemed that this could only be the end. 
As panic gripped the city, they turned desperately to their gods. They sent a messenger to the oracle to find out their fate. Here, high in the Greek mountains, can still be found the site of Delphi, the most famous of the Greek oracles. Built around a vast chasm in the mountain from which a sacred spring still flows. Here the Greeks would come to discover their future. They would ask questions of the Pythia, the mysterious priestess who spoke with the voice of the god Apollo. People came from all over the Greek world to consult Delphi and sometimes came from outside the Greek world as well. It was considered to be the centre of the universe. The omphalos, the navel stone of the whole world was at Delphi. People asked questions about their private life, which are just the sorts of questions people want answers to now. Archaeologists have discovered copies of the questions asked of these ancient oracles. Has Aristos stolen the wool from the mattress? Hermione asks, what should I do to have useful children? But as the Athenians walked up this path two and a half thousand years ago, their question was simple and grave. What could they do to save themselves? The oracle's response could not have been more negative. Why sit you, doomed ones? Fly to the ends of the earth. All is ruin, for fire and the headlong god of war shall bring you low. When this message came back to Athens, the democratic assembly dissolved into uproar. It seemed that even the gods had deserted them. But Themistocles refused to panic. He had spent every day since the Battle of Marathon waiting for this moment. He sent the envoys back to Delphi for a second prophecy. Though all else shall be taken, Zeus, the all-seeing, grants that the wooden wall only shall not fail. Argument raged as to what this wooden wall could be. Some said it meant the stronghold at the center of Athens, the Acropolis. But Themistocles had a different idea. He read the oracle and he insisted that it had a different interpretation. He said the ships are the, the wooden barricade which are going to be the key to our success. The Mr. Klee's plan was daring. Avoid a conflict on land and fight the Persians at sea. He ordered the evacuation of Athens for the first time in her history. This order for evacuation, carved into a stone tablet for public display, is still preserved discovered in the back of a Greek coffee house. The Athenians shall send their children and wives to the village of Troizen. All the men should embark on the 200 ships that have been prepared to fight the barbarian. Themistocles ordered that his fleet of triremes should gather at Salamis, a tiny island off the Athenian coast. Themistocles' strategy is remarkable not only because it is innovative and because it is bold, but because it requires extraordinary self-sacrifice on the part of the Athenian people. He wants every man, woman, and child to leave their homes and possessions and to go into exile.
With Athens abandoned, Xerxes' mighty force entered the city. The Persians march in and go up onto the Athenian Acropolis, the symbol of Athens. And they burn it. They burn the temples to the ground. Then you can see the smoke rising from Salamis. This would have been a devastating sight and a humiliating one. They would, in short, have seen their country occupied by a fearsome foreign invader. Surely they would have wondered if they would ever be able to go home again. As night fell, Themistocles met the leaders of the other Greek city-states on the island of Salamis. They had also assembled their much smaller fleets here. Their scouts had reported back. The Persians now not only held Athens, but had also gathered a mighty fleet four times the size of the Greek forces. But Themistocles' plans were laid. Themistocles sticks to his guns, and his plan is to defeat the Persians at sea. He wants to fight in this narrow, body of water between the island of Salamis and the Athenian mainland. The trick is going to be to get the enemy to fight there because the Persians aren't stupid. Themistocles sent his servant to Xerxes with a seemingly traitorous message. The Greeks are afraid and are planning to slip away. They're squabbling with each other and will offer no opposition. You have at this moment an opportunity of unparalleled success. So eager was Xerxes for a crushing victory, he was happy to believe Themistocles' ploy. Xerxes marshals his admirals and they embark and they spend the night rowing send a contingent along the eastern defile, the strait there. They try to block up the straits. Only as the dawn rose did the Persians realize the true nature of Themistocles' plan. They discovered the Greeks not in disarray, but ranged in a battle line across the narrows in front of them. The Persian fleet had been lured so far up the straits that it had no room to maneuver. The powerful Greek triremes bore down on them without mercy. The Greek playwright Aeschylus fought in the battle and lived to tell the tale. We heard from every part this voice of exhortation. Advance, ye sons of Greece. From slavery save your country, save your wives, your children save. This day the common cause of all demands your valor. The Greek forces smashed into the cornered Persian fleet. Xerxes himself watched the carnage from his golden throne placed on the shore. At the end of the battle, the Persians had lost 200 ships. For the Greeks, it was a stunning and conclusive victory. 
victory at Salamis is tremendously important for Greece and for the Athenians. It breaks the Persian navy. The Persians can no longer guarantee that they can feed their army, nor can they guarantee the safety of the Persian king. He must immediately get back to Asia Minor while the going is good. In practical terms, the game is over and the Greeks have won. Themistocles' triumph was complete. He had persuaded the Athenians to build a navy. He had convinced them to sacrifice their entire city to bring them victory at sea. His instincts had been proved right. He had defeated the greatest empire of the day. And he had now placed Athens in a position where she could build an empire of her own. After the years of conflict, this was a new dawn for Athens. The Athenians are going to have naval superiority in the Eastern Mediterranean. And that is how great their victory over the Persian fleet is. And this has a momentum of its own. Before you know it, the Athenians are the head of a naval confederacy. And they're on the road to becoming a superpower. The Athenians founded the Delian League, an alliance of Greek states designed to keep the Persians in check. Its treasury was located here on the island of Delos, where the ruins still remain. By 450 BC, this league had more than 200 member states but Athens was the undisputed leader. The Delian League had become Athens' empire in all but name. And Athens' naval supremacy also gave her economic power. She became a city at the center of a vast trading network. Goods from all over the Mediterranean flooded into her harbors. In its heyday, Athens was the big apple, or if you will, the big olive of the Eastern Mediterranean. Constant coming and going of traders. The wharves would be busy, full of people in a cacophony of language. One contemporary author gave an account of the diversity of goods in the Athenian marketplace. From Cyrenia, ox hides. From the Hellespont, mackerel and all kinds of salted fish. Libya provides abundant ivory. Pagasae provides tattooed slaves. Carthage, rugs and many colored cushions. The Athenian empire was unprecedented in the degree of prosperity that came to it because of its role as a center of trade. The Athenians had access to a quality of life that probably no Greek had ever had before. Athens' rise to economic and political supremacy occurred at lightning speed. After the Battle of Salamis, she became the dominant power in the Eastern Mediterranean in less than a generation. And at the city's heart still lay her unique system of government, democracy. A system of voting using pebbles, olive leaves, or the show of hands that decided every aspect of the city's government.
Democracy gave the Athenians a great advantage of unleashing talents, powers, opportunities that other cult cultures simply cannot match. The Athenians keenly protected their democracy from any threat, foreign or domestic. Once a year, each citizen could scratch the name of an individual onto a shard of pottery, known as an ostrica, and place it into a pot in the assembly. The person whose name came up most would then be ostracized, banished from the city. This was the Athenians' method of protecting their government, expelling any person they felt might become too powerful. But Athenian democracy could turn on any citizen, even its greatest war hero. Themistocles now found himself under attack. The threat was gone now. His raison d'etre has been taken away. This is something he can't understand. Themistocles reacts, perhaps in an uncharacteristically crude way, he reminded the Athenian voters of what they owed him. Voters don't want to be reminded in any period of what they owe to their politicians. They want to be told what their politicians can do for them. The Athenian people turned on the aging politician. Calculated, cruel, but deeply democratic. They ostracized the man who had led them to their greatest victory. Themistocles was ostracized, I believe, because he was simply regarded as having gotten too big for his boats. Some of the ostraca with Themistocles' name still inscribed upon them have been found, hidden down an ancient well. Archaeologists believe that these had been pre-prepared by Themistocles' enemies. to be handed out to Athenian voters who couldn't write. The Mistocles never recovered from this humiliation. He was to spend the rest of his years wandering from state to state, finally dying in exile in Persia, the country whose defeat had been his greatest triumph. The Athenians were now looking for a leader who might fulfill their newfound sense of imperial glory. They found a man who seemed the perfect reflection of this new ideal. A man who would change the face of Athens forever. A man named Pericles. It's probably not a more important figure in the history of classical Greece than Pericles. He was the leader of Athens at the height of its power and of its artistic achievement. He was the figure associated appropriately with bringing Athenian democracy to its climax, to its height. But Pericles was no obvious democrat like Themistocles, for he had been born into one of Athens' most elite families. And perhaps because of his aristocratic origins, Pericles knew what the people of Athens now wanted. A city fit to rule an empire. It seems clear that Pericles had in mind to create a city whose greatness would be admired by the people who lived there, by everybody else in the Greek world, well into the future. Heracles announced a glorious new vision to the Athenian assembly. 
All kinds of enterprises should be created which will provide inspiration for every art, find employment for every hand. We must devote ourselves to acquiring things that will be the source of everlasting fame. Pericles turned his attention to the Acropolis, the sheer peak in the center of Athens, home of the city's patron goddess, Athena. Twenty years earlier, the Persians had burnt down the temples that stood here. Ever since, the Athenians had left these ruins untouched as a memorial to those killed in the war. But Pericles had other ideas. He proposed a massive reconstruction plan. At its center would be a new Parthenon, a temple to Athena. And it would be one of the most astonishing buildings of the ancient world. This new construction program was of unprecedented magnitude and expense. The Parthenon in particular was extraordinarily expensive. It was filled with all sorts of architectural refinements. Pericles planned to spend over 5,000 talents in the first year alone. A total budget of more than a billion dollars in today's terms. This project would require 20,000 tons of marble. The Athenian quarries at Mount Pentelicus, just outside the city, resounded as hundreds of workmen traced out and carved great blocks of marble from the mountain. This temple would be decorated like none before. Sculptors and craftsmen were gathered from all over the Greek world. With them stood Pericles, for he treated the building of the Parthenon as his own personal project. He selected architects, he selected the men who designed the plans. Pericles was directly involved in the planning process. Some protested that he was decking out the city like a prostitute. But when the building was completed in only 15 years, his critics were silenced. The Parthenon was and still is the most glorious symbol of Athens' empire. Here was the spiritual heart of the city, the mark of her wealth, power, and artistic genius. When you first came through the door, you'd have been just stunned. You'd have been confronted immediately by an enormous 40-foot high statue of Athena in gold and ivory and studded with jewels. I think the, the impression of a statue of that size and with that kind of dressing must have truly overwhelming. Pericles had embellished his temple like no other. Though this astonishing statue has since been lost to history, other treasures from the Parthenon have survived for over 2,000 years. The most famous is the Parthenon Frieze, 
500 foot long stretch of carved marble which ran around the inner wall of the temple. The Parthenon frieze is only two and a half inches thick at its maximum depth. And yet, in this space, the sculptors carved rank upon rank of crowded figures, a great procession of Athenians, glorious and elegant. Here, Pericles offered his fellow citizens a vision of themselves and their democratic state at the height of their glory. Democracy itself becomes heroized in that monument. It's a very democratic thing that wants to include all those citizens who participated in beating off the first great threat to democracy, which was from the Persians. These are ideals to which you can aspire. The monuments that Pericles built for his fellow Athenians still stand on the peak of the Acropolis. They remain the most striking legacy of classical Athens, an enduring testament to the achievements of the world's first democracy. But Pericles was not simply concerned with astonishing construction projects. Under his leadership, Athens would also become the intellectual center of the ancient world. Pericles was remarkable in that he associated with the leading minds of his day in just about every field of endeavor. In these years, Pericles played host to an astonishing generation of individuals. Figures such as Anaxagoras, the first man to realize that the moon was lit by reflected sunlight. He knew Herodotus, the world's first historian, who wrote one of the earliest records of Greek life. And poets and authors such as Aeschylus and Euripides, whose works are still standards of world literature. Pericles was well aware of his city stature. Our whole city is an education. For our citizens excel all men in versatility, resourcefulness, and brilliance. Even Pericles' partner, a woman named Aspasia, was unique and distinguished. Pericles had divorced his wife and set up home with a foreign woman, a woman whose occupation was hardly to be expected. For Aspasia was what was known as a hetaira, Greek for a companion. Yes, she was, in a technical sense, I guess, a prostitute, but she was more than that, a woman of charm, of style, of intellect. She really was very extraordinary. She had an extraordinary mind. This relationship caused scandal throughout Athens, not just because of Aspasia's profession, but because Pericles treated her as an equal something deeply unusual in 5th century Athens. One of the things that created such a stir was that Pericles had her participate in conversations that he had with some of the most important individuals with whom he talked. There's jokes to suggest that Aspasia actually was uh, the person who wrote Pericles' speeches. Pericles and his circle were to become one of the most famous and influential groups in Western history. But in 5th century Athens, the highest achievements of art and culture were not restricted to the elite. Here in the shadow of the Acropolis sits the world's first theater. Twice a year, the Athenian population would gather here to watch a great festival, a festival of drama. Television, cinema, theater, all owe their existence to this place. For here is the home of popular entertainment. There's one huge difference between the ancient theater and our own, and that is that it was incredibly noisy. 
We hear stories of how when they didn't like a play, the audience booed and they hissed and they actually got actors driven off the stage. But there's other stories that show that when they were going with the story and deeply involved in it, they actually all collectively burst into tears. The favourite tales of the Greek stage were called tragedies. These were stories as shocking as a contemporary horror movie. The tragedies told stories of great men falling from their heights, losing everything they owned. Greek tragedy shows human beings, however able, however brilliant, however intelligent, quite unable to alter the destinies which have been decreed for them. These tragedies have fascinated audiences ever since. This 19th century painting shows the story of the mythical ruler Agamemnon, who was murdered by his own wife. Another tragedy told of King Oedipus, who gouged out his eyes when he discovered that he had married his own mother. These Athenians, natives of the greatest city in the ancient world, seemed to revel in seeing how frail greatness could really be. I don't think we can use Greek tragedy to tell us exactly what happened in reality. It's not a document of Athenian social life. But what it does do is take us directly and immediately into the psychological heart of those Athenian men. The kind of dreams and fantasies and fears and imaginary scenarios that they came up with in the theatre have to tell us just as much about them as any document of everyday reality could. Theatres were built in every major Greek city, in Sparta, Corinth, on the island of Delos, here in Delphi. Athens was the heart of a cultural revolution that would spread across the Mediterranean and echo around the world. in Athens seems to me to belong in the smallish collection of cities where truly great moments in the human experience took place. Culture in the broadest sense reaches a, a peak. But after 20 years of building the cultural capital of the Western world, Pericles and his fellow Athenians would now find that their theatre and their tragedies would hold a bitter sting. It is possible to think of Pericles, indeed I think of him, as a man with a tragic flaw, as the sort of man whose greatest qualities, the ones that make him most admirable and successful, turn out to be the seeds of his own destruction. Heracles began to plan a grand new venture. A venture even more ambitious than the Parthenon. He wanted to make Athens the undisputed leader of the Mediterranean. Little did Pericles know that he would now bring Athens not glory, but death, destruction, and the loss of her empire. Athens, the year 431 BC. Heracles takes the podium of the great democratic assembly and presents the Athenians with his most daring plan. War with Athens' oldest enemy, the city-state of Sparta. Sparta was the only other Greek city-state which still matched Athens in power. For the Spartans, trained from birth in the arts of war, were a fearsome military force, and they ruled all of southern Greece. Heracles was convinced it was time to finally vanquish this old rival. 
victory over the Spartans would make Athens the undisputed leader of the Mediterranean. If we go to war, as I think we must, be determined that we are not going to climb down. For it is from the greatest dangers that the greatest glory is to be won. The assembly embraced Pericles' plan. The Athenians were never ones to shrink from a fight. The ancient Greeks as a whole were not by any stretch of the imagination a peace-loving people. Peace was an interruption of war rather than vice versa. And the Athenians were uh, as bellicose as any other Greeks. But for all the Athenians' enthusiasm, Pericles knew that this would not be an easy war to win. Athens' power lay in her navy. The Spartan infantry could well defeat her on land. And so he proposed a strategy of unusual complexity and sophistication. Pericles convinced the Athenians to abandon all the land around Athens and to retreat behind the great long walls that stretch down from the city to its harbor at Piraeus. Pericles would use the Athenian navy to supply the city by sea. And he would use this same navy to attack and harry the Spartans from the coast slowly wearing the enemy down until they gave in. It was a strategy based on a set of finely judged assumptions. Pericles' expectation was that after a year or two, but no more than three, the Spartans would realize that they could not win the war because the Athenians would never give them the infantry battle they needed in order to win, and they had no other device available. The Athenians crowded behind the city walls. Confident in their vision of imperial power and glory, they assumed that Pericles' strategy could only bring them victory. But among this teeming multitude could be found one man who refused to assume anything. A man unique in Athenian society. A man called Socrates. If you were an ancient Athenian citizen, the first thing you'd see is a man who was unbelievably ugly. His head was too big. His eyes were too large. His nose was all the wrong shape. Socrates' appearance breaks every rule of classical Greek aesthetics, of the idea of proportion and measure. Socrates walked the streets of Athens barefoot, clad only in a dirty robe. He cared nothing for appearance or any of the other conventions of his day. Socrates was interested only in the mind. This unlikely figure would become the leader of a revolution. A revolution in thinking that had been gathering strength across the Greek world. This revolution had begun far to the east of Greece, in the legendary city of Babylon where the world's first astronomers had gathered great records of the movement of the stars, the sun, and the moon. For they believed that these celestial bodies were gods. This knowledge and study of the heavens had been slowly spreading across the ancient world until it reached Greek colonies on the coast of what is modern-day Turkey. There, a shattering change occurred. 
for the Greeks took this astronomical knowledge and transformed it. They took the gods out of the heavens and replaced them with reason. Gradually the Greeks begin to say, these are not persons, these are things. There's an orderly world which the human mind can actually capture. It is subject to our understanding. These Greeks began to calculate and predict the movement of the moon and stars through mathematics and logic, rather than using gods and spirits to explain everything. It was the birth of science. The first great Greek scientist, a man named Thales, wrote the earliest book on navigation and how to sail using the stars as a guide. And on a journey to Egypt, Thales was the first man to measure the height of the Great Pyramid. Brilliant idea. He stood next to the pyramid until high noon when his shadow was exactly the same length as his height. Uh, and at that point he measured the shadow of the pyramid and accordingly knew the, <laughs> the height of the pyramid, which is actually an application of a rather sophisticated geometrical theorem. But Socrates was not interested in the stars and the heavens. He would use this new way of thinking, using reason and logic to study people. The great change comes with Socrates, who turns his back, so to speak, to the world of nature. What he cares about is the individual. You become an object of study and care. Socrates spent his days in conversation, walking the streets of Athens, talking and debating with anyone he met. With over 150,000 people now packed behind Athens' walls, he was in his element. One of the amazing things about Socrates is that he is the first fanatical urban individual. He loves the city. He makes life in the city one of his major concerns. Socrates' life was spent questioning the assumptions his fellow Athenians held about their lives. What they felt was right and wrong, what was good and bad. And he was happy to turn convention upside down. One of Socrates' followers recorded how, at the end of a drunken dinner party, Socrates proved to a fellow guest that he was, in fact, the better looking of the two. My eyes must be more beautiful because they bulge out, and therefore I can see better. And by the same account, my nose is more beautiful because my nostrils flare out, and so I can therefore gather in more smell. This is typical Socrates, using reason and logic to examine the world anew. Socrates says, you must make every decision based on your own understanding of what is good and what is not good, what is right and what is wrong. For Socrates, this freedom of thought was paramount even if it meant upsetting the whole notion of a beautiful nose. I tell you, let no day pass without discussing all the things about which you hear me talking. A life without this sort of examination is not worth living. But as Socrates spent his days in debate, his city was fighting a war. The Spartans invaded Athenian territory and set about burning all the farmland around the city. The Athenians became increasingly anxious. 
They could only watch from the city walls as their fields and crops were destroyed. But such was Pericles' reputation, he managed to convince the Athenians to stick with his plan. The city could rely on her fleet and shipments from overseas to survive. Little did Pericles know that this fleet now carried an even greater threat. One year into the war, the grain boats that fed the city brought with them an additional cargo. Plague. A disease that would now devastate Athens. Pericles' plan couldn't anticipate difficulties that we now would suggest were rather likely uh, in those circumstances of crowding. And the results were horrendous. With the population crammed behind the city walls, the affliction spread like wildfire. The symptoms were horrific. The Athenian historian Thucydides, who lived through these years, recorded its effects. The body was suddenly seized, first with violent heats around the head and redness and inflammation of the eyes. And then the disease descended into the bowels, producing violent ulceration and uncontrollable diarrhea. The sufferings of individuals seemed almost beyond the capacity of human nature. Sufferers, racked with fever and overcome with unquenchable thirst, would crawl into the city cisterns and water mains to die. The city must have looked terrible, smelled terrible, been awful to be in, and terror must have reigned everywhere. The plague would kill over a third of Athens' population. And then it struck the city's figurehead, Pericles. Plutarch, Pericles' biographer, described his symptoms. The plague seized Pericles, not with sharp and violent fits, but with a dull and lingering distemper, wasting the strength of his body and undermining his noble soul. By the end, the patrician hero of the city was reduced to relying on potions and magic in an attempt to cure itself. He showed one of his friends a charm that a woman had hung around his neck, as if to say that he was very sick indeed when he would admit of such foolery as this. Finally, after six months of lingering illness, Pericles died in 429 BC. Pericles had planned to make Athens into the Mediterranean's greatest power. But his carefully calculated strategy had brought only disease, and death. Like most brilliant men, like most people who have had great success all their lives, Pericles simply underestimated the degree to which some things are out of the control of the very best intelligence and the very best knowledge that there are. Pericles' death would have far-reaching consequences. It soon became clear that this one man had been the linchpin of the Athenian state. 
Without a single strong leader, countless figures now scrambled for the top position. And they were happy to do anything the people wanted, if it gave them power. For Pausanias, the effects were swift and dramatic. Pericles' successors, who now wanted to occupy the top position, simply followed the prejudices and passions of the masses in order to gain support. Athenian democracy now revealed a new and terrifying potential. The potential to slide into mob rule. Crippling her ability to fight a war. As the conflict raged on, an Athenian naval force won a skirmish with the Spartans in rough and storm-tossed seas. The generals who had commanded the force returned to Athens expecting a hero's welcome. Instead, they were thrown into prison. The storm had forced the Athenian commanders to sail straight back to Athens without picking up any of the soldiers who had fallen overboard during the battle. Rabble-rousing speakers had convinced the assembly that this failure to rescue the men was a crime so appalling that all the generals should be summarily tried and executed. We know of only one man who stood up and attempted to calm the fevered assembly. Socrates. Socrates alone and against the very, very serious and vocal and aggressive and mad, furious reaction of the public stood his ground and said it was the wrong thing to do. He was going to vote against it. Socrates' principle of questioning the society he lived in now had a real and practical purpose. But in the end, Socrates was only one voice amongst the multitude, and he could not sway the assembly. The generals were condemned to death by drinking poisonous hemlock. With the assembly in the hands of self-interested despots, once mighty Athens began to lose her way. After the death of Pericles, Athens never again had a political leader with a well thought out general picture or a set of goals that he could pursue with reasonable hope of bringing them to fruition. The war against Sparta degenerated into a bitter, dragging conflict that spread over a decade. The Spartans ravaged the land around Athens, and the Athenian fleet kept the city supplied. Neither side was able to defeat the other. Deprived of victory, the Athenians grew increasingly frustrated. Were they not the greatest state in all of Greece? Surely the time must come for Athens to prove her power once and for all. Then, in the year 416 BC, a daring proposal was put before the assembly. A small Greek colony on the island of Sicily had asked for protection. Protection from a neighbor allied with Sparta. Why should the Athenians not come to their aid, humiliate their Spartan adversary, 
and perhaps conquer all of Sicily at the same time. As one Athenian addressed the assembly, This is the way we won our empire, and this is the way all empires have been won. Let us set out on this expedition, for it will destroy the arrogance of the Spartans, and at the same time we shall become rulers of all Greece. It was a bold plan to be executed on a vast scale. requiring a great fleet of warships and a landing force of over 10,000 men. The Athenians threw themselves into the project with fervor. Armorers beat out new weapons. Soldiers tested out their equipment. Stores were loaded onto a fleet of Athenian triremes and the shipwrights prepared their vessels for the sea. Then, to great fanfare, the mighty invasion force set out for Sicily. Six months later, word came back. The campaign was not going as quickly as hoped. They needed reinforcements. And then, nothing. No news at all. Then, in the autumn of 413 BC, a sailor arrived in the city. A man who needed a haircut. And as he talked to his barber, he told an appalling tale of a vast and terrible slaughter. It was the story of an invading army that had been pinned down where it landed. Of how its leaders had argued with each other about strategy. Of how their food and water had run out. Of how they'd attempted to ford a great river in a desperate attempt to escape. They rushed into it. All discipline lost and every man wanting to cross first. They fell over each other and trod each other underfoot, and they drank thirstily. The water was foul, but still they went on drinking, mud, blood and all, the dead lying thick in the riverbed. This was how the Athenians discovered that they had been the victims of one of the greatest defeats in ancient history. Over 50,000 men had been killed or taken prisoner. Two entire fleets of Athens' prized triremes had been destroyed. The Sicilian campaign is a mess for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's a long way away. It's over six or seven hundred miles. Once they arrive, they squabble and fight about what to do. But perhaps the biggest problem is there's not a tactical reason to do it. There's not a strategic reason to do it. The motivation is highly self-interested. They believed it wrongly that they could go quickly in, raise the countryside, and win a quick victory and a rich tributary subject state. The Athenians, entranced by a vision of imperial glory, had in fact engaged in a pointless and vain campaign.
With Athens' military power now crippled, her enemies began to close in. The Persians, whom the Athenians had humiliated 50 years before, now saw the ideal opportunity for revenge. They approached the Spartans with the offer of help. The Persians have been watching this carefully and they decide to intervene and subsidize the Spartans and that subsidy is in the form of manpower for rowing and fleet construction. Where previously the Spartans had never been a naval nation, now they had a fleet paid for with Persian gold. With Athens navy decimated by the defeat in Sicily, the Spartans can now blockade the Athenian harbors. The great grain convoys from Egypt and the colonies could no longer get through. And finally, the Athenians began to starve in the streets. The people turned to their patron goddess, Athena. At the height of Athens' glory only 30 years before, Pericles had honored her with the most glorious temple ever seen. But the goddess could offer no help now. Athens, once so sure of her preeminence in the Greek world, was now home to a population ravaged by plague and war, besieged and starving. With her treasuries empty and her once proud fleet crippled, In 404 BC, Athens finally surrendered to the Spartan commander, Lysander. The Spartans' terms were heavy. The great walls which had defended the city were to be torn down. Her fleet was to be destroyed. We had this wonderful scene of Lysander sailing into the Piraeus and dismantling the Athenian fleet. That's important because the destruction is symbolically a destruction of the Athenian Empire. What remained of Athens' mighty navy was put to the torch with only 12 ships allowed to remain. No longer would she rule the Mediterranean. The Athenians became convinced that they could do, finally, in the end, more than they really could. And I think this is really the, the point in which the potential that Athenian democracy brought about could turn to tragedy. They could achieve great things, they could not achieve all great things. But it would still take one more act of vanity and violence before the Athenians could redeem themselves. the city could be reborn. Humiliated, their empire lost, the Athenians looked for someone to take the blame for their defeat. They searched for an enemy within their city walls. Someone who had dared to question their dreams of supremacy. They searched for Socrates. 
Socrates was a critic. He was critical of the thinking and the thought processes of his fellow citizens, and he was critical about the public affairs of Athens. For over 50 years, Socrates had been publicly questioning and attacking the traditions of Athenian life. And around him, he had gathered a group of youthful followers. Surely, this must have weakened the city's moral character, undermined her hunger for glory. Socrates was arrested on charges of undermining the state religion and corrupting the youth of the city. I am quite sure that especially in a relatively small society like Athens, someone who is constantly questioning the principles by which the society has traditionally governed itself, who we perceived as a very major danger by at least some people in society. You can easily see that a few hundred people might want him out, and they did. The Athenians would now put to trial the one man who dared to question the way they lived their lives. Socrates' trial would be held in Athens' central marketplace under a canopy to shade the fierce heat of the Greek sun. He would be tried by a jury of his fellow citizens, chosen at random, the same kind of group that had condemned six generals to summary execution only seven years before. Socrates would be given only a limited time to defend himself for all speeches in the Athenian courts were timed by a water clock. One jar of water steadily running into another. But Socrates shows no fear in the face of his accusers. In fact, he is positively stubborn. To put it bluntly, I've been assigned to this city as if to a large horse which is inclined to be lazy and is in need of some great stinging fly. And all day long, I'll never cease to settle, here, there, everywhere, rousing and reproving every one of you. It is not an approach designed to win sympathy. Socrates is setting himself and his life against the entire Athenian state. He is doing what he thinks is the right thing to do. He thinks the life he has chosen, this life of thinking for yourself, is the best life. As he says in his speech, the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. If Socrates had simply apologized to the court, he might well have been acquitted. But instead, he demands free dinners for life, for all the work he has done. I can just imagine what that jury and the audience of that trial must have thought at the time. They must have been absolutely speechless. When the final vote came, the verdict could hardly have been a surprise. The court found Socrates guilty with the penalty of death. But Socrates reacted with calm and serenity. Well now, it is time to be off, I to die and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but heaven. Socrates was taken from the court to Athens prison.
The site of this prison still exists. We can still trace the layout of the cell in which Socrates was probably held. And we still have accounts of Socrates' last days from friends who visited him in his cell. Socrates would be executed in the traditional Athenian manner by drinking hemlock. Some of the hemlock cups used for the poison are still preserved. Death by hemlock is excruciatingly painful, causing gradual paralysis of the central nervous system. But as the moment of his execution drew near, Socrates turned to his friends, treating the whole affair as if it were nothing at all. For me, the fated hour calls. In other words, I think it's about time I took my bath. I prefer to wash before drinking the poison, rather than give the women the bother of washing me when I am dead. But as the hemlock was poured, his friends broke down. We have the account of one named Fido. In spite of myself, the tears came pouring down, so that I covered my face and wept broken-heartedly. And then everyone in the room broke down, except Socrates himself, who said, Really, my friends, what a way to behave. I'm told that one should make one's end in a reverent silence. Calm yourselves and be brave. As Socrates lay back on his bed and let the poison take effect, his friends watched in silence. Here was a man who was dying not for glory, not for fame and honor, but for the sake of his principles, because he believed that man should question the world around him. It was a sight they would never forget. Socrates in his life and in his death becomes a completely new Greek hero. From now on, the hero is a person of conviction, a person who will follow nothing but the dictates of his intellectual conscience, and that is a new conception of what a human being is like and what a good human being must be like. For centuries, the Athenians had believed in one ideal. The vision of a martial warrior hero. It had driven them to conquer great foes, to build a mighty empire. But now, in the depths of defeat, they discovered a new figure to venerate. Effigies of Socrates have been found amongst the ruins of the Athenian prison. Perhaps offerings to the dead philosopher. Perhaps the most important lesson that Socrates left is the need to be critical and the need to be self-critical. The interesting thing that I see in Athens in the years after the execution of Socrates is this same capacity to look at themselves and recognize that they have perhaps gone too far in the past and indeed to embrace a certain kind of maturity. Athens was never again a great imperial power. But neither did her democracy lapse again into mob rule. Instead, she became a city of intellectual inquiry. 
a haven of study and discussion, where Socrates' students and his students' students slowly began to build a world based on reason. Plato tried to formulate the ideal society. Aristotle studied nature, establishing biology and zoology. And slowly the ideas and work of these Greek thinkers began to spread across the known world. One could say that a major part of the energy of the Athenians turns into building what one might call empires of thought. So where before you had Athens sending its ships to the various islands in order to collect taxes, here you have reason extending its dominion over all areas in which our lives are actually lived. Socrates' principles of reason, of questioning assumptions and the world around you, still endure. In the space of less than 200 years, the ancient Greeks transformed their world. For amongst these ruins, a few great figures carved a mighty empire. They invented democracy and politics, science and philosophy. They gave us literature and drama, art and monuments which still take our breath away. And ultimately, these Greeks taught us how to reason and think. Two and a half thousand years later, their astonishing achievements continue to shape our world.